welcome to episode 211 of the Cricket Her Weekly. Um, we've just emerged from <laughs> having watched the last match in the England New Zealand series. Of course, that's an overnight job here, so it started at midnight, yeah. carried on till like six in the morning. So we're kind of tired and kind of fuzzy, but we're going to go for it anyway. We're running on coffee and, um, and other things. <laughs> Um, Raf, how do you look back on the entire series? What, what, what are your kind of key takeaways from the series? Just to say that I was in the uh, post-match press conference over Zoom with Sophie Devine um, after she smashed that amazing century in, the, in that further ODI that we've just had. Um, and um, I said, congratulations, Sophie. Brilliant innings. Really enjoyed watching it, even though it's the middle of the night here. <laughs> The New Zealand press officer was like, thanks for all the English journalists, you can go back to bed now. <laughs> anyway, um, so from an English perspective, um, I guess overall it's sort of positive. Um, England won the T20s and 4-1 as we talked about in last week's episode um, and then have won the ODI series 2-1 in the end. Um, Divine's kind of heroic put paid to um, the win in the, in the third ODI that we might have hoped for. On the other hand, New Zealand are quite good at winning those dead rubber matches. They've got a little bit of a track record. I don't know if that's necessarily a thing to be proud of, um, but that, you know, I did say ahead of the third game that I thought maybe New Zealand might be able to edge it, um, having already lost the ODI series. Um, but I still feel like from an English perspective, um, I don't feel that there's an awful lot to kind of jump up and down and be really excited about. Um, we obviously talked about uh, kind of Maya Boucher last week, um, who was obviously the kind of standout in the T20s. Um, and we're going to talk about some positives as well, some other positives um, from the ODIs. But I guess from our perspective, you kind of think, well, England did almost the bare minimum that they were expected to do because we would expect them to beat New Zealand consistently, right? And they did do that. Um, but on both occasions when they lost the match, it was at, you know, that first, the, the match in the T20 series and the third ODI, it was because of a really quite poor display with the bat. Um, and they kind of got themselves into situations where the middle order just, just crumbled on both occasions. Um, and Heather Knight did sort of address this a little bit in the in the post-match presser she said um we struggled with tempo and we need to work on soaking up the pressure better so i think that's good because they are kind of recognizing that actually um they do need to kind of work on that that mentality the sort of psychology of batting um and not losing you know four or five wickets in a cluster as they're doing at the moment and then you put enormous pressure on the lower order and actually england could have lost another one of the ODIs very easily if Amy Jones and Charlie Dean hadn't kind of come to the rescue. Yeah, definitely. Um, what, and what about New Zealand? How do we see that New Zealand have, you know, what, what are they going to be coming out of it talking about? Well, obviously, Sophie Devine's 100 in the final match. Um, it was good that she got some support from Maddie Green. I think that was quite important. Although in some ways um, that was kind of coming in a relatively low pressure situation when the bowlers had already done the hard work um, and ensured that there was a total that it was kind of quite or re relatively straightforward in terms of getting yeah, those go, runs. You didn't need to go mad to chase un under four and over from the, from the off. Yeah, I mean, and there was a, um, you know, Brooke Halliday had a good innings the other day. Um, Izzy Gaze has had a, a couple of a good innings. Um, and so that's that's been kind of positive, um, especially Gay is sort of very much the next generation. Um, and I know that I've been a bit critical of her wicket keeping, but it was good to see her actually performing with the bat. And I suppose that's why, to some extent, why she's in the team as the as the chosen wicket keeper. Yeah, I mean she's kind of very much the future. It's almost as if they they kind of England had got rid of Amy Jones and you know put in Bess Heath already into into that role. And if that had happened, then we'd probably be seeing similar criticisms of. You know, he's wicket keeping, and you know it's one of those things. Mm -hmm. Wicket keeping, wicket keepers have a slight, slightly longer shelf life. A bit like goalkeepers in football, you expect them to go on perhaps a little bit longer. And you know, it does take time to you know learn that learn that craft. It's you can't quite you know most people can't run on instinct for for wicket keeping. It's it's about you know learning mm -hmm. how to do it. So she's got a lot of time ahead of her, and you know she's clearly they've clearly decided they're going to give her that run yeah. in the team. Um, you know, and if she can take advantage of that, then you know she's got the potential to play in you know, a couple of hundred games for New Zealand over the next ten years. I suppose, from a New Zealand perspective, just like slightly worrying that they they didn't have Sophie Devine um, for those three matches, and then she comes back um, and kind of leads them to that win, and it was very much um, a sort of you know she's the headline. 
Um, and we always talk about, um, or we have often recently talked about New Zealand very much relying on um, a, a small kind of triumvirate of players of late, um, Divine being one of them. Um, it felt like a little bit of what we've talked about with England and Nat Siver Brunt um, in terms of when she's there, the rest of the team play better. Um, and that's not a long term strategy. I know you wrote in your piece for Cricket Her that she, what is she, 35 now? Near, very nearly 35. She, okay. A couple of months. Um, it's a couple of months shy of it, and obviously 35, she's still young, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> well, but in cricketing terms, But yeah, not absolutely. By the, by the time most people have hit 35, you know, they're, you know, they're already into their commentary careers. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but, you know, while she's still enjoying it, and she clearly is still enjoying it, she, she, she obviously, you know, you can see that from the, the oh, smile on her yeah. face when she's out there. She's fantastic. She, she's going to carry on. Yeah, and, she's a great you know, cricketer, New great Zealand, person. You know, yeah. I'm not... Not going to drop her while while that's continuing. No, absolutely because not. She is so key in their lineup because the only other young player they've got is Amelia Kerr, and Amelia Kerr is not the player that's going to hit the kind of innings that um, you know. Us slightly ironically, given that Amelia Kerr, of course, does have the record for the highest ever score in ODIs. Yeah. But you know, there's a huge caveat that was, that was against a very weak Ireland side. Um, you know, and it was a little bit of a one-off because generally she's not a big boundary. She's not the player that's going to hit you. Go for two sixes off off the the end of the match. And I thought it was a fascinating story that came out of the press conference as well, Raf, that you that you were telling me about. Um, Nat, Nat Siver actually responsible for. <laughs> how, yes. how, how did Nat so Siver? So we were obviously spending the last few overs going. Are there enough runs for Divine to get her hundred? Are there enough runs? And it got to the point where um, she was on eighty eight. And, in, and, and New Zealand needed um, 12 runs, exactly 12 runs for the win. And apparently she said afterwards that she had no intention of, of hitting sixes. She was, because they had loads of time, um, but Nat Silver Brunt was kind of goading her and saying, oh, you're only a couple of hits away, so why don't you go for it? So she did, <laughs> and she flipping well did it as well. She hit those two sixes and she got her 100. And if it hadn't been... Very, the, the very wee hours here, I would have cheered very loudly, but the neighbours might have had something to say about that if I did. But it was a brilliant moment. Uh, but interesting that she was sort of goaded into it a little bit. Just on the New Zealand perspective though, Sid, um, I don't know whether this is um, just because of kind of a run of um, difficult results for New Zealand, but I've just got a little bit of a sense of kind of some rumblings of discontent within New Zealand cricket during this series. It's very difficult for us because we're covering it remotely. We're not on the inside. We don't really know what's going on, but there's been some comments on Cricket Her, some comments on our videos, um, a few things on Twitter, and actually a kind of couple of moments of, on commentary where you've just got a sense of that there's not, that, you know, that all is not quite happy in across the camp of kind of New Zealand women's cricket. So for example, um, I think Frankie Mackay actually said, um, Early on during the T20s, oh, Sophie Devine's comments about New Zealand women's cricket lacking depth are insensitive at best and offensive at worst. Because Sophie had done this interview just before the series, kind of saying, oh, I'm a little bit worried about the next gen, but um, I think that New Zealand cricket are doing everything they can to try and correct it. I didn't really see any problem with those comments, but she's obviously sort of ruffled feathers a bit. And we've definitely had a few comments of people saying that they think that there's um, some issues going on with the selections. Um, and uh, some sort of like in, in the, it's about who you, it's the suggestions that it's who you know yeah. rather than how well you're playing in some of these selections. Now we have I mean, no this, idea of knowing how how true any of this is. It's all speculation. This is what happens when you. I mean, at the end of the day, they're not a winning team at the moment. Yeah. Uh, their record in the ICC Championship is that they've won the same amount of games they've lost. So they've well, won eight, lost eight. They've had two no results. They're going to almost certainly end the ICC Championship. Um, you know, with a losing record because their two remaining series are against India and Australia, and you'd be, I'd be surprised if they win both of those series. Um, so, you know, and that is what happens when you, you know, people, there will be rumblings if yeah. you're not a winning team. Yeah. You know, but it's but, not particularly helpful if that's what's no. kind of being <laughs> talked about. Um, yeah. So, from a New Zealand perspective, um, nice to end on a high, but obviously a lot to a lot to think about and kind of chew over before they're actually coming back to England in about six weeks' time. So, um, all a bit of an odd scheduling, in fact. Um, yeah. yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the way that the schedule has fallen. Um, so, so Sid, um, we've talked a bit about um, England's uh, difficulties with the bat this series and, and Heather Knight's discussion of that in the, the kind of post-match press conference earlier today. Um, lots of sort of 
questions about the middle order and, and frailties with the middle order and maybe slightly epitomised by the fortunes of, of Alice Capty recently, um, who's kind of had a, a run of um, low scores, didn't play in the in the final ODI, was sort of limping out on crutches at the end, even though England are very much trying to downplay this and say, oh, it's a, yeah, it's a minor like, injury. It's a minor ankle sprain and she comes out on crutches. I mean, maybe yeah. she just thinks crutches are a really good look on her. They bring <laughs> out her eyes. I, I don't know. But I mean, that is worrying. We've got the England the English domestic season starting in two weeks and it's not too long until Pakistan are over here. Um, England will definitely want her firing on all cylinders for that. So... That is a slight concern in terms of injury, but but overall, um, she's not had the best tour, has she? No, it's it's been a difficult one, and there's been some suggestions that you know perhaps that it, that we should have dropped her, and that um, you know it was sort of fortunate that England sort of could drop her without actually dropping her today. Well, we actually I, had a question come in on social media about that, um, specifically saying, "Is the jury still out on Capsi? She seems very inconsistent. Does she apply herself fully?" Which I think is a little bit um, is a little bit negative, but what do you think? Sam? I think that well, there's definitely some interesting questions yeah. there. I I think that you know, at the end of the day, we know that she's a hugely talented player, and England are not going to drop her, and they're right about that. I think. I mean, is, she has won. I mean, I had a look back at all the games England played since the start of 2023, and it's all a bit subjective, um, but. She has won four games for England since the start of 2023, including a game against Australia in the Ashes and a game mm. against India in the T20 series in India. Uh, no one else apart from Nat Siver has won more games for England um, in, in that period. And so, you know, she's, she is performing, but she definitely does appear to be somebody that needs those big stages. So if you think about all the, the big games that she's won, they've all been on the big stages. Mm -hmm. She's performed in WPL. She's performed in the 100 when she's been playing at Lords. She's performed in the Ashes at Lords. Yeah. She's performed against India. So when the spotlight's on... And there's then, lots of people watching. She sort of feeds off the crowd a bit. Yeah, she? she does. And that's, that seems to be a thing. And you know, this has been a fairly low-key series. And it's interesting to turn it on its head as well and think about Amy Jones, because Amy Jones had a very good series. And there have been the people saying... As we've seen we've heard several times in the past, oh, Amy Jones has finally overcome her, her kind of mental frailties and things. Mm -hmm. Except that while well, this, this has been a very low-key series, it's been a series that hasn't been hugely in the media in this country, so people aren't massively talking about it. Outside Partly because of, of the timing, Yeah, right? because of the time difference. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's harder to watch it. The crowds have been not huge compared to in New Zealand compared to the crowds you get here. So actually, in some ways... It's been the kind of classic Amy Jones time to shine when a lot of people aren't watching. Mm. So, you know, I think that there's, there's, there's two sides to that. And it'll be interesting to see what happens when we get back to England in the summer, because I think that those big crowds are what Alice kept your fire off. And I think that we're going to see performances again from her in the summer. I feel confident that, that she's going to deliver there. I just find her frustrating because you know that she can deliver and that she has so much talent. If, if she wasn't that talented, then um, her getting out stupidly, um, first or second ball, you just sort of shrug it off and go, okay, oh well, the next person's coming in. But um, it just, it feels a little bit like she kind of loses her head sometimes or she loses, she doesn't, she doesn't concentrate from ball one or she just, she just plays the first shot that comes into her head. And we saw that very much in the WPL final, didn't we? Where, we did. You know, she decides that she's going to ramp Sophie Molyneux first ball completely unnecessarily. Um, and why would you do that against a really good kind of um, on-song bowler? But maybe that's just the price that you pay for a player that, as I say, is winning matches for England yeah. and, and against the top so side. She's going to be so. inconsistent. Is what well, you're maybe, saying. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Now, another interesting. player that the people have talked about, Raf, is uh, Charlie Dean. Yeah. Because Charlie Dean, she's the fastest player ever to get to 50 international wickets. Um, in, ODIs, in ODIs. In ODIs, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of actually pretty incredible, really, isn't it? Well... I, yeah, it's a bit astonishing because she hasn't been um, kind of, as I, as I put it in the Guardian piece, she so often pay, played third fiddle to Sophie Eccleston and Sarah Glenn. Um, so to actually achieve that milestone in so few matches, I think it's taken her 26 matches, is pretty phenomenal um, and speaks to the fact that when she does get in the team, she so often does take wickets. Um, and that, So I do think that England will come away from this tour um, looking really positively at the role that she's been able to play. Um, it's you been know, she's chipped in with a bat as well. Yeah, course, she has obviously, absolutely two really important innings. Yeah, and you know, kind of been showing other people the way to play, um, which is which is not necessarily um, kind of 
the the jumble mile a minute approach. Um, it's actually no, she's not a jumble big, batter. She's, she's almost not. playing test cricket in these ODIs, isn't well, she? Well, yeah, and you just um, I don't know. I just I think that's that's really brilliant. But I, I hope that the the coaching staff are actually kind of recognising that and going, okay, maybe this isn't quite in line with the philosophy, but it's been a lot more successful than some of the batting that has been in line with the philosophy. If that makes sense. So, well, it's what you need from a number eight batter. Yeah, you definitely. need someone that's just some stickability that's going to go, okay. I'm I'm going to stick around with the last of the kind of recognised batters yeah. and I'm going to ensure that Amy Jones doesn't have to bat with the tail for, you know, while she makes her 50 and gets well, us to, to what was quite close to a decent score. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't a decent score, but it wasn't a million miles away yeah. from one. And we've so often praised Australia for that um, kind of late middle order um Sort of, stability and yeah, stickability exactly so you think that you're just about getting through to the tail and then they magic up a really big part yeah then Alana somewhere. King comes on and yeah and that's exactly 20 what, overs later she's still there yeah that's exactly what Amy Jones and Charlie Dean did in that first ODI that meant that actually England's wobble wasn't as much of a calamity as it as it would otherwise have been so yeah um it's been it's been really Good to see her successful, and she's obviously going to be a really important player over the next 12 months in the, the um, T20 World Cup in Bangladesh and the 50 over World Cup next year in India, because those are going to be pitches that really kind of call for the selection yeah, well, we're of three spinners. Three, the three spinner yeah. strategy is going to be the one. I mean, England did do that again today, of course, because they rested Lauren Bell, um, you know, and they, although they didn't have a third spinner, sorry, that's not quite, didn't come out quite right. But the point, my point was that they, they went in with only one proper fast bowler. It's uh, with Lauren Furler today, mm -hmm. it's been Lauren Bell for the first two matches, so we're expecting that to be their strategy. One proper fast bowler, and then probably three spinners going into that tournament in India. And of course they've got Natsu Brunt, um, who's actually been opening the bowling um, in some of these matches. So they may consider her a, a kind of proper Fast bowler. Yep, I think that she's going to be, they're, they're really looking to her to do a lot of bowling workload over the next year. Great, okay. Um, Sid, there's also been this uh, under-19s tour going on, hasn't there, which we haven't talked about a huge amount on the on the podcast, but that's that's wrapped up now, um, and England have had success in that, haven't they? Yeah, well, the T20 part of it's wrapped up. We've still got some one-day matches right. to go, um, but England have actually won their T20 kind of tri-series with Sri Lanka and Australia. Fantastic, and guys, congratulations. You'll never guess who came last. It, and it, I'll give you a clue. It was well, obviously it wasn't England. It wasn't Sri Lanka either. I, I don't know who else. Who, who, who else, else could it be? be? <laughs> oh well, we love it when Australia <laughs> lose, don't we, Sid? No, that's very mean. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so you know, but um, you know, great positives for England. Davina Perrin finished up the the leading run scorer. We still always forget how young she she actually is. Yeah. That because she's been involved in professional cricket for a good couple of years now, but she's actually still going to be eligible for the next t under nineteen. World Cup. Yeah. Um, so she was the leading run scorer. Ava Lee, the, the, the leading wicket taker. So um, some good takeaways from mm. England there. And also some, I want to just mention some credit to the Sri Lankan Cricket Board for putting a lot of effort into the, the broadcast of this. They've had, you know, decent quality broadcast with multiple cameras. They took pictures of all the players before the series. So all of the graphics on the screen were all the, you know, the right players with decent quality pictures. Uh, good commentary. Mm. Everything was real, really positive about the presentation of this series. Far, far better than the job that New Zealand did with a static camera and no commentary for the England A versus yeah. New Zealand A matches. Um, you know, and I appreciate that New Zealand are in a position where they have to pay kind of first world wages to people working on it. But on the other hand, the Sri Lankan cricket board, you know, don't have the money. That no. the, the money they have is reflected in the, you know, the the fact that you know, yes, they're not paying first world wages, but they could have kept all that money. And, and honestly, if they just provided a single fixed camera and no commentary, we probably wouldn't have complained. So full credit to them that they gave us the opportunity to kind of watch and enjoy this series. Yeah, really important um, ahead of the under nineteen. World Cup as well, because we're hoping that that will have a kind of proper broadcast as well. Yeah, absolutely, and that did last time, to yeah. be fair. But you know, it's very, it's it's, it's very positive that Sri Lanka put absolutely. that effort into the presentation in this series, and fantastic for all of the girls that were playing for from all of the countries. Yeah. And congratulations to England. Um, and finally, this week, Sid, um, there was a Will McPherson piece uh, published yesterday, I think, um, in the Telegraph. Um, which you seem to have found particularly interesting, even though it's ostensibly about men's cricket. So what's going on, Sid? Yeah, I just don't want to very quickly address this. It was, it was just because it was kind of an interesting article that 
that it, it epitomised some people's attitudes. Essentially, it was an article saying that um, the PCA, the Professional Cricketers Association, it's the cricketers' union in this country, are concerned that some of the men's first-class clubs might go bust and that their members might not get paid. So they're urging the ECB to kind of protect the salaries of the male players to ensure that if any clubs do go bust, um, which apparently is a, a definitely a possibility, that the players still carry on getting paid. And I wanted to just, like steam a little bit about this for two reasons. The first is that, um, you know, whenever anything comes up with like putting more investment into the women's game, a lot of people from the men's game still scratch their heads and go, yeah, well, but unfortunately, you know, commercials, can't really we can't afford it. If the women's yeah. game can't pay for itself, then, you know, I'm afraid that's just the reality of the market. And then suddenly, oh, the reality of the market when a club might go, oh, no, no, we can't, we, we, we don't want to, we didn't mean that sort of attention yeah. to the market. <laughs> So they want to buck the market. And the other thing is that is there's, you know, fundamentally, the reason that the men's first class counties are in, some of them are in financial trouble is because they're paying their staff too much. Their yeah. wage bill is too high. Who are their key high paid staff? They're the players. Now, I understand how we've got to this situation because they're kind of competing for players and they feel in a global market. And there are, you know, rich clubs and every club wants to compete. But at the end of the day, guys, if you're going to pay your top male cricketers hundreds of thousands a year and you can't sustain that with the money that you don't forget, you get you know, your million pounds from the ECB every year and um, you, know, you get your share of the, you know, the, all your gate revenues and everything like that. If you can't sustain your business, then maybe you need to look at the fact that you're possibly paying your top employees yeah, too much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's either that we've got too many professional um, counties, which we've got 18 at the moment, or they're paying the players too much. Um, and there has been a lot of talk about the kind of future of English cricket, but nobody seems prepared to accept the realities of the market when it comes to men's first class cricket in this country. Everyone's quite happy to push that agenda when it's in relation to women's cricket, and it is a bit frustra frustrating. Anyway. Let's wrap up there, Sid. Um, don't know if we're going to go back to bed. <laughs> I'm absolutely shattered, but we've got our season starting in a couple of weeks, so it'll be nice to, for it to be back on our own time zone. And um, we will see you in a week's time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.